Today we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We had, uh, last week we had uh, talked about Ruth, and we're kind of uh, carrying this, this uh, the momentum that is being uh, generated from that story into uh, 1 Samuel here. And it's funny, we're, uh, we're talking about prayer, uh, and I wanted to uh, see where the Lord leads us with regards to your prayer life, how you approach the Lord uh, with prayer. So, uh, so I titled this, Bring the Lows to the Most High, um, orienting, orienting the Heart to the Lord. Let me, let me start off with this. Um, don't get distracted by the picture, but there's a purpose to uh, why I'm showing, showing you a, pic, a picture of guinea pigs. Um, when you think about all the different help organizations out there, uh, there's a, there are many. I mean, quite honestly, uh, there is probably some organization, some foundation, some uh, club or group or gathering, support group, available for all kinds of help, all kinds of uh, problems that you're going through. If you, have, uh, if you have a drinking problem, there's an organization for that. If you have problems with, uh, with uh, cars or uh, with relationships, with marriages, whatever it may be, there's a club or an organization or a help uh, group for that. And, and, and I started, uh, I don't know, for, for some reason I started going down the, uh, the line like, is there a, a, a support group for abandoned guinea pigs? And there is. Amazingly, there is. Uh, and, and this organization is um, called, uh, what is it? Um, the Critter, uh, they call it uh, the Critter Connection. Uh, so basically, uh, they're, they're kind of their mission statement. In a world where dogs and cats are known as pet royalty, other pets like guinea pigs are often left to fend for themselves. The Critter Connection started in 2004 to make sure that no guinea pig gets left behind. The Rescue and Habitation Center takes in neglected or abandoned guinea pigs. When necessary, they help nurse them back to health and find them loving homes. To this day, they've helped save over 1,500 guinea pigs. There is an organization to, to help with any number of things. And, and with that in mind, why do we need God? When you think about all the different help organizations that are out there, why do we need God? There is no need. When you could, uh, when you could pick up a, a, a phone and, and call this 800 number to reach this particular organization for whatever issue that you're going through, we really don't have a need for God. But let's be honest, no matter how many different help organizations there are out there, we still do need God. You don't know, uh, you don't know how low you will reach before you start asking yourself, where is God in all of this? And that's kind of where 1 Samuel comes in. Uh, when we, if we take a, uh, a quick read through 1 Samuel, it probably sounds something like this. There's a, there's a broken family. This one woman named Hannah, uh, she's not able to have children. She comes before the Lord. She prays, uh, and then she has, has children suddenly, right? That's kind of like the, the massive, massively overstated summary of what 1 Samuel chapter 1 is all about. But we miss so many important details when we, uh, when we do something like that, when we do something like that. The, I mean, that's the quick read. I mean, and when... And if we read scripture like that, and we skip over all the details, what do, we, what do we walk away with? We end up with God being like this genie in a bottle. Oh, uh, Hannah prayed this way, so that means I can pray that way, and I can get whatever I want, right? But that's clearly not the case. Because when we pull back a little bit and look at the larger picture where this story is set, we see that Hannah would bear a son. His name is Samuel. Samuel would be key in transitioning the nation of Israel from, from the era of the judges to the time of the monarchy. To, uh, he is, Samuel would become the prophet that anoints uh, King Saul and then ultimately King David. Without Samuel, this, uh, Israel may not have gone through this transition. They probably would have been stuck in the period of the judges and would have gone through even more cycles of, 
uh, woe is me, a prey, and then uh, be delivered, and then, uh, um, and then going back into that cycle all over again. But because of this one, woman, one woman's prayer, a transition in an entire nation was possible. The true power, one of the, one of the big things that, uh, that I walked away with here, is true power does not, is not found in one's position in the world but in one's standing before God. Right? True power is not found in one's position in the world, but in one's standing before God. Let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. So if we look at, uh, if we break down chapter one, at least the first half of it, what, what do we see? Uh, verses one and two, we see kind of the setting. We, uh, Elkanah is, is, the, is the husband, the father, and he has two wives. We may look at that and say, why, do, why does he have two wives? Well, the first wife wasn't able to bear children, so he must have wanted to have, uh, have children to carry on his, his family legacy, so he has, it brings in another wife. The uh, second wife would then have children, but Hannah would not have any children. Uh, verses 3 through 8, we see... Um, let me, sorry, let me just uh, advance this. I can, if, we, uh, if we look at verses 3 through 8, uh, what do we see? Family worship is incomplete. Elkanah, the, the husband, the, the patriarch of this family, would take the family out to, to Shiloh every year. Shiloh is kind of this, uh, again, this transitional place from uh, the mobile tabernacle to be, uh, and before uh, the, the final establishment of the temple. The sh this place, Shiloh, would be kind of the semi-permanent place for where people can encounter God, where they can come and worship. And so you have Elkanah coming out, bringing his family every single year and, and worshiping and, and bringing offerings. But during this time, the second wife would always ridicule the first wife. Uh, Pen, uh, Pen, Penina, would, the second wife, would always um, just, uh, yeah, just ridicule Hannah, the, the first wife, over and over, year after year. Uh, Hannah would endure this. Hus the husband would, would remind Hannah, you know, I'm giving you a double portion. Uh, is not my love enough uh, e e equivalent to having 10 children, right? But still, that love is, uh, somehow of the husband is not enough. Verses 9, nine through 11, Hannah uh, comes before the Lord and shares this one prayer. And this was the, uh, yet another pivotal moment. Verses 12 through 18, Hannah has this conversation with uh, the high priest of the time, Eli. And, and what, a, what a contrast between Hannah and Eli. H uh, Eli is supposed to be uh, the, the most uh, spiritual, spiritually mature person uh, of the nation because he has the closest relationship with God. But yet Hannah demonstrates that she has a far better understanding of God than he does. And then verses 19 and 20, we see that God answers Hannah's prayer. But let me ask three different questions to kind of dig into, into this narrative a little bit more. What was Hannah focused on? What was, what, was, what was it that really troubled her the most? Here she's going through a lot of pain. On a local level, she's experiencing pain. She's experiencing humilia humiliation. She ex ex is experiencing sadness. Even, again, the love of the husband was not enough for her. Right? So she focused probably on, I can only imagine, Lord, if you would just give me a child, uh, I would be released from this pain and this humiliation, this, this ridicule from this, this second wife. Right? So that's uh, probably what's happening on a local level. Another thing that, uh, that we see here, and this is, this is probably a, a challenging point for a lot of us to, to wrestle with, God is responsible for Hannah's barrenness. If you look at verses 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6, what does it say? But to Hannah, it's 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, But to Hannah he gave a double portion, this is Elkanah, a uh, double portion because uh, he loved her, though the Lord has closed her womb. Okay? And then verse 6, And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord has closed her womb. Twice mentioned, it is the Lord that closed her womb. Now, we could stop there and say, God, it's your fault. 
God, you are the one who's bringing this upon this woman. In fact, we may look at this and say, Lord, you are putting me through the whatever hardships right now, the challenges I'm having at work, the, the, the broken relationships, the, 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 the marriage that I'm just having a diff really difficult time with right now. You, Lord, it's, it's your fault. So, but we see here that it is the Lord that closed her womb. But if you know God, he does everything for a purpose. There's a reason there's a reason why you're going through whatever you're going through right now. Uh, God has a plan because God's, God's responsible. But then we also see this, this other element, Hannah's faith. Hannah's, Hannah's going through all of this. She could have had many different ways of, uh, of going about addressing this. But one thing that she does, what we saw in verses 9 through 11, is that she comes before the Lord. Again, year after year, she would endure this, 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 this awful worship experience, coming to, the, uh, to Shiloh and, and bringing this worship, but still not having her heart in it and, and being um, bothered and ridiculed over and over again, year after year, until this one point she came and, and stepped before the Lord and, and, and said, what, what, is, what does she say? Verses... Um, Verses 9 through 11. Let's take a look. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sit, sitting at the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and whipped, wept bitterly. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody weep bitterly. Just hearing that, it breaks your heart. The, the, the crying, the, uh, the wailing, and it's with such brokenness. It, it, it just pierces the soul, and that is the heart that she was bringing before the Lord. But what does she do? She takes it one step further, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, I will give, you, give to you your servant, give to, uh, but, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to, to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. In this moment, she becomes, I mean, she literally becomes a theologian. Have you ever had a moment where you're, you're brought to the lowest of lows, and, you, uh, and you're, uh, you, re, you, you like hit rock bottom, and, and suddenly you become theological? You come before the Lord, and you have this 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 unique prayer, this powerful prayer, and it's a prayer that, that, that really is transformative. It, it's going to change everything. Whatever it is you're going through, or whatever it is that you've been through, or maybe even what you're about to go through, have you been brought to a point where you are brought to such a low that you don't have any other place to go, or, or maybe you don't want to go to any other place, but you only go to God, and you come and you have this, di this type of dialogue. What are some of the things that she says? She, her prayer was really uh, turbocharged. It was, it was empowering in, in, in a, a very incredible way. She recognized God. She recognized God in the context of her circumstance. What do I mean by that? What was on her heart? Her, on her heart probably was, was uh, and it's revealed in the prayer, she wanted to have a son. But one of the most powerful things is she looked upon God and, and knew that God is the giver of life. Oh, Lord, you're the giver of life. You are the one that is able to make this possible. So I come to you because you are the giver of life. When, when we come before the Lord, how, what, who do we recognize him as? Oh, Lord, you're, just, you're, the, you're the, the vending machine for me. No, 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 no. Lord, you are... You are the, uh, the creator of all things. You are the, uh, the orchestrator of all these relationships. Lord, you are, you are the giver of life. Lord, you are the one who, who authored these, uh, the, uh, the definition of marriage. And, uh, Lord, you, you instituted marriage. And so I am come to you for, for answers to this. I come to you because you are the source of this. Are we able to uh, come before the Lord in our prayers and say, Lord, I recognize you for within the context of the circumstances, the circumstances that I am in and recognize that you 
are sovereign over this. It's powerful. She had, she had a hard time trying to figure out how to uh, do this on her own, and, 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 and she couldn't have a child of her own for years. And then finally, Lord, you are the giver of life. I come to you. What else do we see? We see that she puts herself in the right position before God. What do we see in this, in this prayer? This is one of the longest prayer of a woman in the Old Testament. And, and, and it's recorded here. And, and at the same time, yeah, and in this prayer, what do we see? She's, she describes herself as a servant. You are the master. I am the servant. And she repeats this over and over. You are, uh, you are where you are at. I am where I'm at. I am your servant. And if, you, and if you will just grant your servant, I am your servant. I will give to, if you will give your servant, I will, I will give this back to you. And that leads me to my third point. Not only does she know her position, but she also recognizes that in this prayer, it's not about taking. It's not about just taking. How many of us come to the Lord and say, Lord, I want, I need, I, and, and it's all about what you can take from that relationship. Where is it in that dialogue, in that prayer, in that relationship to say, Lord, I will give. I, I, will, I will give this. And, and I want you to ask this question to yourself when you come before the Lord in prayer. What is it that the Lord truly wants? What is it that the Lord truly wants in all of this? Now remember, I mentioned that God is the one who is responsible for making Hannah barren. And you have to ask yourself, what did God really want out of Hannah? He wanted her heart. God wants all of our hearts. He wants us to have that, that attention being drawn to him and, and um, that affection to be laid upon him alone, right? Hannah doesn't even have the capacity to love her husband or to receive that love from her husband. Yet here, at this moment, she's able to turn to the Lord and say, you know what, uh, I'm going to give you what is most precious in my heart right now, which is to have a son, and I'm going to give that over to you. That's, that's powerful. Are we able to say, Lord, if you will give this to me, if you, will, if you will save my marriage, I will give my marriage to you. If you will give me this job, I will give this job over to you. If you give me this child, I will give you uh, this child uh, in return. I mean, are we able to turn it around and say, Lord, what I have been asking for for so long, what I really want deep down in my heart, I'm going to give it over to you. I mean, are we really ready to give it over to the Lord? Because here's the thing. If we just ask and take and, just, uh, and not give anything in return, if we don't even give him our heart, then what makes us think that he is going to truly respond to our prayers? If we can't even give him our heart. These are, these are the three things that I walked away with when I looked upon this prayer from, from Hannah. And I was like, wow, am I praying like that? Do I, do, I, do I recognize who God is in my circumstance? That he is the giver of life to me. He is the one who orchestrates all these things. He is the one who puts this person in my life to have these struggles with. He, he is the one that, uh, that was able to provide for me in these moments. And, and then recognize that I, I am his servant. I am nothing before him, but he desires a relationship with me. And, and in that, am I ready to give him all Give him my whole heart. What I desire most, I will actually give it back to him. Here's my challenge to you. Well, uh, actually, before we get to the challenge, let me, let me share this verse with you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Go to the Lord. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, Go to the Lord 
with confidence that knowing that he's going to he's going to provide he's going to he's going to answer but also understand he he desires our heart he does not want our words words are empty if it doesn't uh, doesn't include our heart behind it which leads me to this whatever we're doing wherever we find ourselves this week let's come before the lord and let's just give him our heart Give the Lord your heart. When it comes to prayer, when it comes to serving, when it comes to, uh, to relationships, when it comes to uh, whatever, let's give him our whole heart. Let's give him our whole heart. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. And let's, let's, just, let's just take a moment right now to examine our hearts. What is it that you're going through right now? Are you experiencing a challenge? Are you experiencing a heartache? Are you experiencing a burden? Do you feel that, that heaviness upon you? What we've talked about earlier, are you, when you step outside of the church, are you feeling the heaviness of this Bay Area? Whatever it is, we, can, we have a God that's, that can come in great force with great power and lift all this away. But what he desires most is our heart. So in the midst of your challenges, your circumstances, whatever it is you're going through, are you able to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I just want to give you my heart. Because the beautiful thing about all this is that when, when Hannah gave this prayer over to God, she was able to walk away from Shiloh with joy upon her heart. And this was even before the Lord answered her prayer. That, that heart that she gave over to the Lord was all that she needed to do. And the Lord right now stands in our midst, ready to receive our heart, to lift us up out of this. If you are coming into this relationship brand new, this is a time to give your heart over to him. To say, you are, you are my God. You are the one that I love. I recognize Jesus as my Savior. And he is going to be my Lord. Give your heart over to the Lord right now. Father God, Lord, I want you to hear the hearts of all the brothers and sisters here and now. Father, you know what they're going through. You know their struggles. And Father, I pray that you will just use this time to remind them that you stand right next to them. That all, all you look for is that heart. That heart to, that is surrendered over to, to the one true God. Hear our hearts right now as we worship you. We love you, Lord. We give you thanks, and we pray in Jesus' name.